from Road of Sholem, we're in the thick of it. So uh, it makes it even more interesting and exciting to know that there is a real Pittsburgh connection to uh, what's happening here. Get this off. So I think more people are joining us as we go along here. I don't know if I should wait a minute or so. Um, generally, what I guess I'm, I'm seeing John, you're shaking your head that you're here. We should start. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll take care of everyone coming in. Here's okay. Here. All right, that's terrific. So, um, so as I say, this was a bitter, bitter dispute in the Jewish community. And I want to delve into this controversy uh, through the lens of the three reform rabbis at Rodef Sholem, whose tenured covered uh, the first uh, half of the 20th century. Um, so, so let me get right to it. And I want to provide a little bit of context uh, first. And uh, Please, if you have any questions, uh, am I gonna be able to see the chat function? Uh, um, okay, I guess so, I don't know. All right, presumably I can see the chat function. If I'm not, uh, just chime in with your question, okay? I don't think we have that many people that um, it would be, uh, it wouldn't work. Um, in 1897, let's start with this. In 1897, at the first World Jewish Congress, Theodore Herzl called for the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. It was a clarion call that was going to profoundly affect Jewish life around the world, uh, and certainly in America as well. Now, he was not the first one who called for a homeland, and he didn't even call for it necessarily in Palestine. Uh, there had been various intellectuals and writers throughout the latter decades of the 19th century who looked to a Jewish return to their ancient homeland as a historic and important mission. They were motivated by two pressing realities that I want to underscore. Uh, the first one was the ever-present fact of anti-Semitism, particularly in Eastern Europe. Uh, if you think about it, I bet that for most of you here, um, if you think about your immigrant ancestors and where they came from, I'm betting that a good chunk of them came from Eastern Europe. Uh, mine certainly did from the Russian Empire. Uh, I wrote about Sophie Maslov, her immigrant parents came from Romania, and they came here because this was uh, a, a refuge. This was, they were escaping here from an hospi inhospitable environment in, uh, in Eastern Europe, to say the least. Um, and they fled to America where opportunity beckoned and where they could escape the persecution, the poverty and the despair of the old world. Theodore Herzl, ironically, was not a victim of this reality because he was an assimilated Jew living in the relative safety of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But he was galvanized into action by the anti-Semitism he witnessed when, as a journalist, he covered the infamous Dreyfus trial in France in 1894, when not only was the highest ranking Jew in the French army found guilty of treason in a trumped up trial, I hesitate to use that word, but, uh, but he witnessed crowds in the street yelling death to the Jews. And he was shocked because if Jews could not be accepted in France, the land of the enlightenment uh, in Western Europe, where could they find a home? And so Herzl was transformed uh, as a result of this, um, Dreyfus trial. And I hope that um, if you don't know about the Dreyfus trial, I hope you will uh, try and find out more about it. The second reality that prompted uh, Jewish writers to long for Palestine was the growth of a feeling of nationalism in, the, in Europe in the latter decades of the 19th century. If you know your history, you know that Germany uh, all the various principalities and uh, states were united under Bismarck and they became a united Germany. 
and the various Italian principalities were also united to become the nation of Italy under uh, Victor Emmanuel II, also in the latter decades of the 19th century. So national pride was in the air. And if it was good for the Italians and if it was good for the Italians and the French and the English and the Americans with our manifest destiny, if you know your American history, why couldn't it be good for the Jews? Uh, and Jews began to think of themselves as a nation that should have their own homeland, their own respectability. Without that, they were aliens, strangers in a foreign land, ghosts who could never be uh, embraced. Uh, if you've read Leo Pinsker, a writer, a Russian doctor actually, who wrote after the pogroms of the uh, early eight, 19, 1880s in Russia, he wrote, uh, he, he said that anti-Semitism was because Jews didn't have a homeland and they were seen as these wanderers, as these ghosts uh, who were, um, uh, and wrote a very famous piece known as auto emancipation, that Jews need to emancipate themselves. So here, Theodor Herzl became the founder of the modern Zionist movement a movement that was to culminate in 1948, as you know, uh, long after Herzl's death with the founding of the State of Israel. Jews were to celebrate the rebirth of the Jewish homeland at the same time that they mourned the overwhelming losses suffered in the Holocaust. For 50 years, the Zionists had struggled to secure their dream, but there had been roadblocks which had littered uh, the, the road, not only set up not only by non-Jews, but also by the Jewish world as well. The story of this conflict, arguably the most divisive and bitter in American Jewish history, is a fascinating chapter in the development of, Ameri of the American Jewish committee, community. While there were various Orthodox Jews who opposed Zionism, the ranks of the most vigorous opponents to Zionism were filled with those primarily who identified with the reform movement led by many of the reform rabbis. And Rodef rabbis played a big hand in this struggle. So how did the reform movement view Zionism? They saw the world in very different terms than Zionists. They were convinced that the future of American Jewry was linked, not to some faraway Jewish state, but to a spiritual renewal in America. And that the mission of Jews was to bring peace and justice to all throughout the diaspora, wherever they lived. Jews were supposed to be uh, that proverbial light unto the nations. They believed the world was moving toward a better tomorrow in which Jews would be accepted and able to carry forth this mission. And so they rejected any notion that Jews were insecure where they were, that they needed to separate themselves in their own space, their own territory. Nationalism, particularism, separation, this was not for the Jews. It was theologically, said the reform rabbis, it was theologically misguided, and practically, it would create ill feeling among Gentiles because it seemed to call into question the loyalty and patriotism of Jews in America. America was the homeland of those Jews. The promised land was here, not there. Interestingly enough, Rabbi Freehoff, writing in 1927, uh, seven years before he came to Rodov, when he was still the rabbi of a reform synagogue in Chicago, he wrote a long article, perhaps a sermon, that was published in the Pittsburgh Jewish Criterion. He likened the Zion, Zionist movement to a centripetal force that worked toward a center, a center that he argued was like in medieval times, when Jews were seen by both Christians and Jews alike as aliens, strangers in exile, waiting for a return, but locked in their ghettos. The contrast was the centrifugal force 
looking upon Jews as permanent living around the world, spreading out, accepted and free in the various countries in which they resided. And for Freehoff, he clearly embraced this latter notion at the time. This profound difference in philosophy, ideology and outlook between the Zionists and those who oppose Zionism was only reinforced by the social and economic gulf between Zionist and reform adherents in terms of background, tradition, and class. The reform movement was the bastion of the older, more established German Jews in America who came in the middle of the 19th century to America and including Pittsburgh. The first Jews in Pittsburgh to establish a community were German Jews and they established Road of Sholem, which initially was an Orthodox rule, but within a few decades uh, changed its whole uh, approach in liturgy. Um, and um, so the German Jews came in the middle of the 19th century, while the Eastern Europeans who embraced Zionism were to come in the late 19th and early 20th century. Just for a quick show of hands, we can do it. I, I see a lot of black screens here, but I'm wondering, just a show of hands or, or a blink of your screen, frankly, how many of you come from Eastern Europe, Eastern European uh, background? Just blink your screens. Turn it off for a minute so we can see the blinking. Okay, I can't really, because so many of you don't have your screens on. Okay, Let, let's try it again, because many of you put your screens on. Those of you who came from an Eastern European background, blink your screens, just turn it on and off. Okay, I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure. Although I do see a lot of blinking. I see a lot of blinking. Okay, uh, Debbie Rogel, one half German and one half what? Eastern European, okay. Uh, it's interesting because Rhoda certainly was um, the bastion of the German Jews. And that's why um, uh, within a few years, Tree of Life was formed by those who were from uh, Eastern parts of German, from Prussia and from Polish lands who really didn't uh, have much in common with the German Jews who had come from Bavaria and Southern uh, Germany. And, and Road of Sholem certainly um, catered to those who came from Southern Germany and not the more traditional Orthodox Jews who came from uh, Eastern regions. Um, and of course, the, the, the chasm between Eastern European Jews and German Jews was wide. And uh, uh, anybody who crossed the divide did so at their own risk. And that's a whole topic in and of itself. But anyway, it's in this context that I want to look at the three rabbis who presided at Road of Sholem throughout the first half of the 20th century. J. Leonard Levy led the congregation between 1901 and until 1917, when he died suddenly a victim of the influenza epidemic which of course has been in the news uh, because COVID, the COVID epidemic has been compared to the influenza epidemic of 1917, 1918. Uh, I think the influenza, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the influenza epidemic took about 600,000 lives and I think uh, COVID now has taken more. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, Samuel Goldenson took over and remained chief rabbi until 1934, when he left to go to Temple Emanuel in New York City. I think at that time, perhaps the largest reformed temple in the city, certainly a very prestigious one. And then um, Solomon Freeman Freehoff was his successor, who was the spiritual leader throughout the 1940s and beyond. I think Dr. Freehoff retired around 1966, and of course, many of them, many of you saw him as he lived to be well into his 90s. Um, together, these three wise men 
like that, spanned the years of the great Zionist debate in America. So how did each respond to the challenge of Zionism? And how did they reconcile a world which increasingly belied and mocked their expectations for progress and universal brotherhood? A look back at their response can afford a real window into the gauntlet that Zionism laid down for reform. And Pittsburgh looms large in trying to understand the intellectual climate of reform Judaism at the beginning of the 20th century when Rabbi Levy took over. Uh, think about the Pittsburgh platform, which I assume as knowledgeable reform Jews, which I know you all are, you have learned about before. In 1885, Rabbi Kaufman Kohler issued a call to 18 reform rabbis in the country to draw up a statement of principle on, uh, on reform Judaism. So somebody just wrote that uh, influenza didn't affect Pittsburgh. I don't think that's true at all. So we can argue that one. We could also look it up and find out more information. Um, uh, Dr. Lippmann Mayer, who had been called to the pulpit at Rodif in 1870, and who was to be one of the participants in this conference, uh, asked the Board of Trustees at Rodif for uh, cooperation in hosting the conference. Uh, the conference itself was held at the decade old Concordia Club in Allegheny, now the North Side. There's a plaque up. You might have seen it. Um, Rabbi David Philipson, who actually was only 23 years old at the time and the youngest participant, recalled in a talk he gave in 1935 that the Pittsburgh Jewish community was, quote unquote, keyed up to a state of excitement, end quote. He described Dr. Mayer as, quote, the genial rabbi who welcomed his colleagues in a spirit of fine fellowship. I'd like to think that they picked Pittsburgh because we were such a leader uh, in the reform movement, but that's not the case. They picked Pittsburgh because it was kind of centrally located between Chicago and New York, and maybe more people could get here. So Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh platform has gone down in history um, as, as putting Pittsburgh on the map and being a very important uh, platform. The rabbis in Pittsburgh at that time, optimistically looked out at the world through rose colored glasses and saw in the modern era, quote, the realization of Israel's great messianic hope for the kingdom of truth, justice, and peace among men. They asserted that, quote, Jews were no longer a nation, but a religious community and therefore expect neither a return to Palestine nor the restoration of any of the laws concerning the Jewish state, end of quote. They said a lot more too about the belief that only those moral laws which tended to quote unquote, elevate and sanctify our life are binding and made other assertions that infuriated more traditional Jews. And in fact, as a result, uh, Jewish, uh, the Jewish community was kind of split between what became known as the Orthodox Jews, conservative and reform Jews, because they simply could not abide by this kind of throwing away, seemingly throwing away of uh, Jewish tradition and practice. One Orthodox rabbi from Baltimore compared the rabbis assembled at Pittsburgh to quote unquote pygmies attempting to pull down the Washington Monument. This might give you some idea of what they thought of the Pittsburgh platform. Um, but while the platform aroused the ire of so many non-reformed Jews for a host of reasons, it also laid the groundwork for the forthcoming battle with the Zionists because it denied any concept of nationhood and it was just 12 years later, after the Pittsburgh platform had been promulgated, that Theodore Herzl now comes along and issues a call for a Jewish state, clearly in direct contradiction 
to the plank of the Pittsburgh platform, which argued that Jews are no longer a nation. The Zionist whole raison d'etre was exactly the opposite, saying that Jews were indeed a nation and therefore needed and should have their own homeland like other national groups. The Central Conference of American Rabbis, known as the CCAR, which was the organization of reform rabbis, set forth its disapproval of the Zionist objective. So here you have within basically a decade of one another, uh, two contradictory positions about what Jews should be and what their emphasis should be. And now the, um, the Central Conference of Reform Rabbis is going to kind of uh, reinforce and reiterate the thinking behind the uh, Pittsburgh platform. They said that the attempt to establish a Jewish state, quote unquote, shows a misunderstanding of Israel's mission, which from the narrow political and rational field has been expanded to the promotion among the whole human race of the broad and universalistic religion first proclaimed by the Jewish prophets. Such attempts, speaking about Zionism now, do not benefit but infinitely harm our Jewish brethren where they are still persecuted by confirming the assertion of their enemies that the Jews are foreigners in the countries in which they are home, which they are at home, and of which they are everywhere the most loyal and patriotic citizens. The statement of the CCAR goes on to say, we reaffirm that the object of Judaism is not political nor national, but spiritual, and addresses itself to the continuous growth of peace, justice, and love in the human race to a messianic time when all men will recognize that they form one great brotherhood for the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. The swords were drawn. In Pittsburgh, when J. Leonard Levy became rabbi in 1901, Zionism was alive and well. Various groups were already formed in this city, primarily on the hill, which was the heartland for the Eastern European immigrants who were piling into the city around the turn of the century. Pittsburgh was a very important Zionist bastion, one of the biggest in the country, some suggesting that we were second only to New York City in terms of our enthusiasm, in terms of our membership. Um, Ralph Raphael, and some of you might've known Bob, uh, was a descendant, was an early, Ralph Raphael was an early proponent of Zionism in the city who was intent on organizing a Lovers of Zion cell even before Herzl made his speech calling for a Jewish state. So that was in the early 1890s. The sixth annual convention of the Federation of American Zionists was held in the city in 1903 and by 1904, the Zionist Council of Pittsburgh was formed and purchased a building on Center Avenue, which became the Zionist Institute right next door to the Irene Kaufman Settlement, which of course was the um, love child of the National Council of Jewish Women, most of whom were reformed Jews. It was financed. Uh, Henry Kaufman was a major financier. Many of members were um, uh, teachers, volunteer teachers at the Irene Kaufman Settlement. But the Irene Kaufman Settlement, interestingly enough, was uh, really a, a, a vehicle to assimilate these Im immigrants into the American lifestyle, teaching them uh, skills and job possibilities, English language, those um, traits and um, habits that you needed to be a, uh, a, a good American. Whereas the Zionist Institute that was right next door was competing and it stressed Jewish tradition, Jewish history, um, and not assimilation, just trying to 
maintain Jews in a very proud Jewish, um, proud of their Jewish heritage. So it's fascinating to, to look at these two institutions, very different, both supported by the Jewish community of uh, Pittsburgh, but with very different missions. Um, and the competition between these two institutions to attract the young people on the Hill and their different approaches is a story in itself, but Zionism was passionately embraced by the masses of the Hill. And to give you some sense of the wild enthusiasm for Zionism, uh, I wanna read to you, I, in my research, I came across a uh, news article that was written in 1921 on the occasion of the visit by Chaim Weizmann to Pittsburgh. Chaim Weizmann, as you probably know, became the leader of the World Zionist Movement upon the death of Theodore Herzl in 1904. Theodore Herzl literally uh, worked himself to death. He died a young man in his early 40s, uh, just a, a few years after leading the charge to try and create this Jewish homeland. Uh, and um, Chaim Weizmann took over. And I wanna read to you uh, the scene and just a little bit from the scene that's described in this news article that appeared in the Jewish Criterion, which by the way, was um, Rabbi Levy was part of the, uh, was one of the editors, major player here. A motorcycle offered um, the picturesque thousands waiting in the penetrating rays of noonday sun, their eyes eagerly scanning the horizon for a glimpse of the procession. The heart-stirring strains of Aktikva, the hymn of hope, rang forth from fife and drum and caught the fancy. Men bowed their heads reverently. Children held their flags tenderly. Hundreds of voices broke forth in song. There was silence, a cool breeze swept through the avenue. How patiently they waited. A motorcycle officer sped by as if a life was at stake. The stifled air seemed to burst with the overwhelming enthusiasm. The throng seemed to sway in a spontaneous undercurrent of emotion. It was the peak of many hours pent up expectation, the summit of overdrawn patience awaiting the moment when they might express a profound passionate faith in the accomplishments of a great leader. That space of waiting was an ovation, a silent mute demonstration that could not be doubted. It came from the heart. It was a manifestation of wholehearted love and respect. It was infinite in its sincerity and unanimity. Another motorcycle swept by. Police, horses, their glistening skin almost blinding in its brilliance, pranced majestically by. One and two automobiles flew by. Then, like the thunderous roar of a cannonball, there rose a mighty cry. Flags waved as if they would break from their staffs. Cheer on cheer rent the air. Men, women, and children yelled themselves hoarse. They fairly screamed in their joyous welcome. Weissman, Dr. Weissman, they shouted. And on he came, this leader in Israel, acclaimed and honored by his people, welcomed with the greatest demonstration Pittsburgh Jewry ever gave a fellow Jew. And it goes on. Okay. I, I, I'm struck by the passion of the Zionist movement in Pittsburgh at that time. Uh, something that I don't think we will see again. Um, uh, something that I don't think we can um, find, uh, get again. But I wanted to read that to you because it's uh, 1921 when Weizmann came here to give you a sense of what's going on in the city and the, the enthusiasm for Weizmann and, and the movement he leads. Um, and meanwhile, what was happening far away from the hill, literally and figuratively in the more refined and assimilated preserve of the downtown temple of Rotosholem, soon to make the move to the high brown neighborhood of Shadyside. What's going on while this is going on on the hill? In a lecture on Zionism that Rabbi Levy gave in January 1902, he made his views very clear. He said that the idea of a Jewish home in Palestine was not a dream, 
but quote unquote, rather a nightmare and a regression. He went on, quote, to think that all these ages of struggle, that all these centuries of effort nobly born should terminate by our going back disheartened, discouraged, broken in spirit and body to Palestine. This was clearly unacceptable to him. But while he was dismissing any idea of a Jewish commonwealth of some sort in Palestine, like other reform rabbis, he was not dismissing the notion of a spiritual center for Jews in Palestine. If Zionism, quote, if Zionism is an attempt to uplift the Jew, to help him attain the rights of men, if it is an effort to reintroduce the spiritual strength of Judaism to the Jew, if it is, if it is an endeavor to make of the Jew a productive laborer, if it is a resolve to colonize the Jew in Palestine and other lands, then the Zionists may claim me as a follower. But when it comes to owning Palestine, I dissent, end of quote. Levy clearly could not conclude, include any nationhood concept in his understanding of what is the mission of a Jew. His emphasis was on Judaism as a religion not on Jews as a people. He stood firmly on the Pittsburgh platform. His solution to the torrents of anti-Semitism that the Jews in Eastern Europe were facing was that Jews must, quote, stand and stand firm and die where they are if need be in order to teach men that God is one, that God demands righteousness as the highest expression of religion. Our purpose as Jews is not to go back to our old land, but in the new world to set ourselves on the side of liberty and justice and truth and right and to teach that uh, aspect of religion which shall enable men to accept the divine fatherhood, fatherhood and establish a human brotherhood. I'm quoting now. Our realm is not Palestine, but a spiritual one. We need no political kingdom, no arms, no special territory of our own, no special country in the Orient, end of quote. A 1907 sermon revealed that Levy had not changed his mind, quote, in all kindness, but in all sincerity, I regard Zionism as the greatest political blunder committed by a section of the Jewish people in two millennium. Zionism is not only not the panacea, but if seriously continued for some years, it will as surely divide Israel as the messianic claims instituted concerning a young Jew 1900 years ago, separated our people into opposing camps. I have heard it said, that we who refuse to countenance this physical material Zion, material Zion proposition are cowards. Politely but emphatically, we return the compliment to those who uttered it. To slink away to Palestine is more cowardly than to face a world in arms. 4,000 years of agonizing are not going to end in ignominious flight back to Palestine. Let those indulge it who will, but as for me and those I may be able to influence, we shall die with our faces to the enemy, not with our backs toward them. Israel's destiny is to live in the soul of an uplifted humanity, not to be buried alive in the Orient, even in the glorious city of David. To think that Zionism would provide safety for persecuted Jews was nothing more than a delusive hope. End of quote. I don't know. I, I'd love if we could get into a discussion of this, but obviously these are pretty strong words. Anybody want to make a comment? Uh, I see some of the chat. Um, do you want to... Uh, Somebody want to help me read the chat here? Uh, okay, didn't affect Pittsburgh, I'm not sure, but let's keep going here. Um, okay, I'm not I'm here to help with the chat. Okay, where are you? <laughs> uh, 
Okay. All right. I, I wish, uh, does somebody want to make a comment? Unmute yourself and, and make a comment if you so would like. Uh, I'm wondering if this, you know, how this strikes you. I mean, this is so really strong words condemning the whole Zionist movement. Any comment from anybody? Yes, Al, I see you got a hand up. Great. Unmute yourself though. Can you do that? Can I do that? Let's see, ask to unmute. Uh, where is the person who's supposed to be helping me here? Hi, uh, I can help you. Uh, please do. What is your name? I don't, I don't have your name. Paige. Paige. Yep. Uh, Paige, please, please um, you know, let people speak here. Uh, okay. Al, did you want to, um, did you want to say something or you had your hand up? Okay. Uh, uh, no, the, the hand was up accidentally. Okay. All right. Any comment though from anybody about these words? How did they strike you? Because I was really, I must say that I was really taken aback. All right. Unfortunately, I'm seeing black rectangles. I'd love to see some faces. <laughs> anyway. Um, this is, we, this is before we co commence, I just want to say, if anybody has questions for the conversation, please send them to the whole chat, not just to the speaker, um, so I can help read them too. Because I, I can't see any of them so far. Okay, Debbie, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to say I, in you, in your book, actually, one of the people named as an anti-Zionist on the Rotterdam board was my grandfather, Robert Feldman. Um, so I, and that's not where I am now. But I grew <laughs> up. I grew up knowing that that was a. I grew up. All I was by the time I was born, the state of Israel had existed for almost twenty years. But I grew up knowing that family members, in fact, had been on this, this radical side of being anti-Zionist. And their attitude by the time I was old enough to ask questions was, well, it's different now that there is a state, right? So, so they would never, he would never have spoken out against Israel once it was a state and it, it was identified as Jewish. So I think it's hard to, hard to comprehend what it was like in a pre- a pre-state right, setting. Right. And, and it was not just the left, but the very far right, not the Orthodox in Pittsburgh, but the very far right who thought that you couldn't establish the state of Israel without the coming of the Messiah, right? They, right, they, but not here in Pittsburgh. The Orthodox right. Jews here in right. Pittsburgh, Rabbi Sivis, right. Rabbi- Right, uh, they, they, I said not in Shinsky. Pittsburgh, but it was interesting that that was the right. dynamic. Um, Barry, I see you said that uh, the Johnstown Jews came to hear uh, Chaim uh, Weitzman. I, I think that's absolutely so. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and in Levy's last sermon, which was to be his last sermon, he, of course, uh, didn't know he died within four days so unexpectedly. Um, he talked about how Jerusalem was an international city and how Palestine should become, quote unquote, a neutral land. It is the only country that stands for religion. Christianity, Islam and Judaism all owe their inspiration to that land. And one and that land should be kept free from all entangling alliances and all signs of war uh, of war. He loved the idea that someone else made that Palestine should become like a national park open to all an international territory of the world. Levy died in 1917, before the end of World War I, before the dissolution that set in in the aftermath of the war. He died before Woodrow Wilson's dream of this war as quote unquote, the war to end all wars went down in flames. He died before he knew that the British had promised the land both to the Arabs and the Jews before Hajimin al Hassani became the Palestinian Arab leader intent on violently opposing Jewish immigration, before the terrible plight of Jews in Eastern Europe in the 1920s, before the onslaught of the Nazis in the 1930s. Levy died before reality set in and the Halsakan world he dreamed of proved to be like Wilson's dream, a bitter illusion. His death marked the end of one era and the beginning of another 
of fading hopes for peace, for protection of Jewish rights and for true brotherhood. And when Levy died, he was mourned by thousands of Jews, uh, including the Jews from the Hill, the Eastern Europeans, because uh, Levy had, uh, while he never accepted Zionism as a political movement, he assisted regularly in raising funds for various Zionist enterprises, including the Palestine Welfare Association. He had actually been giving Bible classes at the Zionist Institute um, uh, right up until the time of his death. And uh, when he died, the Institute published a tribute to him in their bulletin. As they wrote, he had, quote, assisted the cause of Zionism in many ways, though not affiliated with it. They appreciated all he had done and his sympathy for the oppressed without. Levy is really an extraordinary man. Um, and I know you have had some uh, discussion on Rabbi Levy. He clearly was a giant in the reform movement in many ways. So Samuel Goldenson, uh, why did he? Well, because he, it wasn't that he opposed Zionism, he opposed political Zionism, but he wanted to help the Jews who were going to Palestine. He wanted to help build this land up so that he gave money to the Palestine Welfare Society, but he would not give money to a organization that was promoting a Jewish state. So Samuel Goldenson assumed the reins at Rhoda from 1917 until 1934. He was a national leader among the rabbis. And in 1934 and 1935, he was actually president of the Central Council, Central Conference of American Rabbis, the professional organization of reform rabbis. However, throughout his tenure, Goldenson remained a hardliner on the issue of Zionism although he was very concerned about the split that this was causing among rabbis in the conference. He presided at a time when the anti-Zionist position of the Central Conference of Reform Rabbis, stemming from the principles laid down by the Pittsburgh platform, was coming under increasing attack from within the ranks of the rabbis, with more and more rabbis feeling sympathy with the Zionist cause. And of course, more and more rabbis becoming uh, of Eastern European uh, background. Even in the, remember, this is now the rise of Zionism, Hitler coming into power in 1933. And even in the 1920s, Jews in Eastern Europe had been persecuted, killed, their lives made miserable. Palestine was becoming more and more a refuge, a place not so much for a spiritual reawakening, reawakening but as a place they could escape to. But Goldenson held firm to his opposition to any kind of notion of Jewish political control over this land. In 1935, and he's gone now from Rhoda Sholem, he's, he's in New York. In 1935, he opposed the so-called quote unquote neutrality resolution that was passed by the conference, which for all intents and purposes, canceled the anti-Zionist position of the conference that it dated back to the Pittsburgh platform. This neutrality resolution stated that the acceptance or rejection of the Zionist position should be left to the conscience of the individual members of the conference themselves, and that the Central Conference should take no official position one way or another. So Goldenson acknowledged the great debate that was taking place within the reform movement over Zionism at the time, Jews in Germany were already losing their jobs, being boycotted, terrorized in the street. And now in 1935, the Nuremberg laws were passed, denying Jews German citizenship, leaving them totally unprotected and segregated in society. But this debate in the conference, he felt, was nothing less than an attempt to reinterpret the nature of Judaism and, quote, to demote the religion of Israel from the high and exalted place that it has always occupied in the life of the Jew, unquote. While he was sympathetic to the plight of the Jews in Europe, he argued, quote, that the malady is a moral and spiritual one and the cure can only come from raising the general standard of ethical thinking, which he felt rabbis and their Jewish flock must continue to do. After all, to him, this was the mission of Judaism to make the world a better place. 
He admitted that he was not offering an immediate solution to the problem of virulent anti-Semitism, but that placing a priority on Zionism as a secular pursuit, quote, would only diminish the Jewish spiritual quest, which was his paramount mission. And for Goldenson, it was not only the religious life of the Jews that he, in America he was concerned about, he believed that uh, it would affect Palestine itself, making the Jewish community there more committed to a political agenda than to a spiritual and cultural one. Palestine, even run by Jews, would become just like any other state. Goldenson left Pittsburgh for the greener pastures, perhaps, if they were of Temple Emanuel in New York. But we learn about Goldenson's key role in the 1940s that I want to mention. In 1941, an ardent Zionist, Rabbi James Heller, was elected president of the Central Conference of American Reform Rabbis to show you the change that is happening. Um, and uh, indicating the widespread embrace of Zionism uh, as news from overseas keeps uh, piling up. Uh, Goldenson, along with several other anti-Zionist rabbis, uh, anti rabbis, though, opposed what was happening in Jewish schools and synagogues, which was namely a greater emphasis on talking about Palestine, uh, films, books on it. Sabbaths devoted to it. They, they did not like that. At the 53rd convention of the CCAR in February 1942, again with the Holocaust raging, uh, they wanted to prevent um, they, they wanted to prevent the politization of the Palestine issue. Heller, the Zionist, responded, that what these rabbis were doing was coming dangerously close to splitting the reform movement and dividing congregations over this issue. And he warned that their militant anti-Zionist position would undermine efforts to get Britain, which was in control of Palestine at the time under a League of Nations mandate, that it would undermine those efforts to change its policy, which at the time was drastically limiting uh, Jewish immigration into Palestine. This was in response to the uh, riots fomented by Hajamin al Husseini uh, against Jewish immigration into Palestine. Heller stressed that CCAR unity and saving Jewish lives by uh, opening up uh, Palestine. The issue was rapidly reaching crisis proportions within the CCAR. In 1941, David Ben-Gurion had called for the raising of a Jewish army to join the Allies in the fight against Hitler. Uh, a resolution was raised, proposed at the CCAR in favor of this. How do you think Goldenson voted on this one? I wish I could see a show of hands on this one. What do you think Goldenson's? Now, this is a, a resolution to have Jews join a form a, a special Jewish army to assist the British in their fight against Hitler. What do you think? Anybody want to venture a guess? Thought on this? What you would do? God, you guys are quiet. My students would have a lot more to say. I am going to take a guess and Thank say- you. He would Thank vote. you, Sarah. Go. I'm guessing that he would vote no because military is associated with political. Sarah, how many would agree with Sarah? What do you think? Any other comment on this? Uh, Bob, you 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 think you agree with Sarah? You think that uh, Goldenson would uh, would have opposed that? Who is that? It's under. I saw your hand under Bob Rosenthal, but you're not. That's Nancy. Nancy. That's Nancy. 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 Okay. Uncle Bob is sick in the bottom there. Okay. All right. Nancy, you, you agree with Sarah. Anybody else have a comment on this? How would you guys have voted for it? Would you guys have voted for that resolution in uh, 1942 with the Holocaust nope. raging? Would nope. you have voted for a Jewish army to be raised? No. Nope. I think it's it sounds very similar to the colored and to use the historical term, troops during the Civil War, World War I, and I believe into World War II. So 
African Americans serving separately, even though they didn't have full uh, rights as citizens. So I don't know how I would have voted, but it's a very interesting issue. It's a fascinating one. Okay, let me keep going though, uh, in the interest of time. Oh my. Um, uh, Goldenson opposed it because he did not view the Jewish people as a nation, uh, which of course is the going back to the Pittsburgh platform. The resolution in support of the army passed, so the die was cast. To make a long story short, Goldenson and his like-minded colleagues who were in the minority uh, had a conference in Atlantic City, New Jersey soon after this and decided to establish an organization known as the American Council for Judaism. It's title saying again about the mission of reform Judaism. And um, they established now an organization that was specifically devoted against the Zionist proposition uh, right up until the time of the formation of the Jewish state. So we have a rabbi from Road of Sholem now, even during the Holocaust, who is bitterly opposed to, um, to any kind of uh, politic, uh, political politicization of, of Palestine. Okay, um, again, uh, interesting stuff, but let me get to the rabbi most of you know, Solomon Freehoff. Where did he stand in this bitter and divisive chasm between Fisher between reform rabbis? And uh, remember, he comes in 1934, so he is certainly cognizant of the rise of the, of the Nazis and the German plight of the German Jews. Um, won't go into his background. He's descend. It's interesting. I found out he's a descendant from the founder of the Lubavitcher Hasid Hasid Hasidism. Okay. Uh, Clearly, he doesn't um, keep to that lifestyle, but it's interesting that he's descended from that. Anyway, he's the re rabbi of Reform Congregation in Chicago, and then he comes to Rodif at age 42. Uh, among his many accomplishments was the fact that his book review series would draw well over a thousand people, Jews and non-Jews, to hear him. And this was in the day before Zoom. So it is quite a impressive uh, legacy. Uh, he was a force. I had mentioned though, but what was his stand on Zionism? I had mentioned writing that he was in the Pittsburgh Jewish Criterion in 1927 when he was still in Chicago. It was rather a long piece that he wrote, but the bottom line was that he was pleading for a toning down of the rhetoric on both sides. I think this piece signaled the stance that he was to take in the future. He started off by praising what the Jews who immigrated to Palestine had, had accomplished, calling their accomplishments nothing short of phenomenal, and how the Jews had helped the Arabs institute new methods of farming and had provided the medical care, which was having such a positive impact. He then began to discuss why, in his opinion, American Jews who were also immigrants and pioneers in this country, somehow why they did not appreciate uh, what the Jews were doing in Palestine. He clearly was talking about the German Jews and not the Eastern Europeans. Uh, he commented that there is no more anti-Zionist group anywhere in the world than that group represented by the average American Jew. He goes on to describe the Zionist leadership as the most able, the most brilliant, the most personally charming, and how when they come here, the Amer and, and then he can't understand why the American Jew doesn't go for them but he is optimistic that the two philosophies and people will unite. Um, he urged compromise and was optimistic that it would happen. So let me keep going. Freehouse plea to tone down the rhetoric and seek cooperation with these two clashing forces in Judaism was going to be tested, particularly with regard to his role in the Central Conference of American Rabbis. His effort to find a middle ground and calm the troubled waters ironically was going to pit him against his predecessor at Rodef, Samuel Goldenson. That's what's so interesting. We have an in-house dispute here. In 1942, as I have mentioned, all hell broke loose at the conference over this resolution on the Jewish army. The army, as you can understand, would have lent weight and symbolism to the Zionist campaign for a Jewish state and their conviction that the Jews were a nation and not a religious group. When the debate began on the resolution, Freehoff is one of the leaders of CCA, 
AR at the time, was in intent on trying to dampen down the fire. He sought to table the whole discussion and have the debate stricken from the record. He believed that no matter which way the vote went on the army resolution, there would be dissension and satisfaction, dissatisfaction that would only serve to divide the central conference. However, his resolution to table failed and the CCAR as we've seen went on to favor the army proposal. In 1943, both Freehoff and Goldenson were major players. Goldenson as a past chair of the conference and Freehoff soon to become the chair of the conference. Their positions were important in the ongoing discussions at the conference about Judaism. A special session of the conference was devoted to the topic of the compatibility of Zionism with reform Judaism. Zionism was increasingly capturing the imagination of the reform movement as opinions had changed under the crushing weight of the persecution and murder of the Jews in Europe. Moreover, as I've said, within the ranks of the reform movement, uh, there were more and more Eastern European Jews. Uh, Dr. Freehoff was chair of the committee. He presented two resolutions to the conference. The first one stated that the conference de declares that it discerns no essential incompatibility between Reformed Judaism and Zionism, no reason why those of its members who give allegiance to Zionism should not have a right to regard themselves as fully within the spirit and purpose of Reformed Judaism. That resolution was carried. The second resolution, though, that was presented by Freehoff and his committee drew the ire of Rabbi Goldenson. The second resolution called for the dissolution of the American Council for Judaism, which Goldenson had helped establish. Um, Goldenson defended the ACR, this new body, arguing that there was a need for an organization to counter the Jewish nationalist philosophy of the Zionists. He protested the charge of treason made against him and the rabbis who supported the American Council for Judaism and argued that in our democracy, all have a right to their opinions uh, and didn't need to disband. Freehoff in July of 1943 wrote an article again where he um, did not say whether he was a Zionist or anti-Zionist. Uh, he felt uh, such a statement to that effect um, he, he wanted to, I'm, I'm skipping here because I, I'm seeing, he went on to call for the, but basically he reiterated his call for the dissolution of the American Council for Zionism. And after the war in 1945 and two consecutive Sunday morning sermons, sermons at Rota, Frio gave his advice first to the Zionists he knew who were among his con, con, congregants, and then a week later to the anti-Zionists who were also in his congregation. In these two talks, he revealed much about his own temper and outlook on the issues. In his talk to the Zionists, he talked about how Jews are a family, which means they help each other, but they also quarrel with each other. He deplored the fact that the quarrel had continued even in the face of the tragedy of the Jews during the war. Surely the time has come, he pleaded, for reconciliation, for mutual patience, for overcoming of misunderstandings. He spoke about how for the first time in American Jewish life, there was an organized anti-Zionist movement. So now we have both intense Zionists and ferocious anti-Zionists. And between the two, Jewish communities are being torn apart. He went on to say that while it would be unfair and unrealistic to ask a Zionist to give up his dream, what they should do though is tone down their rhetoric. He felt that many non-Zionists became anti-Zionists because of the loud and vociferous protests the Zionists made. But beyond that, when a Zionist speaker gets up and says we must cure the homelessness of the Jewish people, he is not speaking for the American Jew who does not consider himself in exile. So for Freehoff, the rub that was causing such protests was the, um, the shrillness of the discussion. In his talk to the anti-Zionists just a week later, Freehoff, by commenting how almost every fright which we have had in the last 25 years has been at bottom a Zionist, anti-Zionist fight with no compromise seemingly possible. Every great drive, every dispute in the welfare funds, every argument in every city on communal matters, there is the immovable Zionist and the unchangeable anti-Zionist. He deplored what he called extremism on both sides. 
He argued that the number of reasoned anti-Zionists or reasoned Zionists are few, and that there was such a shrill level of debate. He complimented both uh, Zionists and non-Zionists. He said that um, if your arteries are perfectly flexible and your nerves calm and glacial, if you can stand all sorts of wear and tear, be an active Zionist. They use up 100% of nerve energy in the most bitter political disputes. And after that, by some miracle, they have another 100% left for Zionist work. Um, according to Freehoff, Zionists needed to modify their philosophy. Anti-Zionists needed to modify their program. Um, if you can tell a, a person by the friends they keep, um, I think Rabbi Freehoff was a closet Zionist. His best friend, one of his oldest, dearest, closest friends was Rabbi Abba Hillel Silver, who was the fiery leader of the Zionist movement. The two had been ordained together in 1915 at the Hebrew um, Union College and uh, remained friends throughout uh, the entire life of, of both of them. Um, Silver, as I said, was the first American Jewish leader to openly express the Zionist demand for the Jewish state. And earlier in 1935, it was Silver who had led the charge to uh, basically change the paragraph in the Pittsburgh platform, which had denied any Jewish national connection to the land of Palestine. Um, and so uh, Freehoff and Silver remained close, exchanged uh, visits, saw each other on the milestones of each one's life until uh, Silver's death in 1963. And so uh, he really, I think, genuinely loved Silver, called him remarkable, eloquent, called him a hero. Um, I have no doubt that when Freehoff wrote about toning down the rhetoric that he was thinking of silver, but uh, nevertheless, uh, he supported Rabbi Silver. Silver, as I wrote, maybe some of you know, was going to drive the American Jewish leadership crazy and the State Department with his relentless determination in the cause of Zionism. That's another story. So Solomon Freehoff tried to pick up the pieces as the Zionist controversy was tearing uh, American Jewry apart. He gave credit to both, spoke, both sides, spoke kind words to both sides, gave criticism to both sides. The bottom line for him was that the American Jewish community come together to get on with the important task of leading the rehabilitation of world Jewry in the wake of the Holocaust. But his moderation did not win him many supporters of the Zionist cause here in Pittsburgh in the 1940s. Those Zionists who counted themselves among his congregants, who some of whom I interviewed years ago, they described the quote unquote great silence of Freehoff when it came to the subject of Zionism. For the many ardent Zionists outside of Rhode of Sholem, this temple was viewed as the headquarters of the enemy and Freehoff its general. Yet Freehoff was personal friends with Zionists in Pittsburgh uh, and in and out of the city. I mentioned with uh, Silver, he was a committee member in 1940 when Pittsburgh hosted the 43rd annual Zionist convention. In 1946, when Silver spoke to the Pittsburgh Zionist district, Freehoff accepted the invitation to introduce him. Freehoff did not turn his back on Zionist support for Israel, nor did he deny the importance of rebuilding the Jewish homeland. He walked a tightrope within his own congregation and on the national level, seeking to smooth out the rough edges on each side and find the usable center. Now, all these years later, it's interesting to reflect on the concerns of all three rabbis. While the great Zionist debate is over with the Jewish state firmly established, some of the same concerns have again come to the fore. Can Jewish unity be achieved? What should be the nature of the Jewish state? What is the relationship of the Jewish state to America and to American Jews? And beyond these questions is the old concern that all these related political issues 
uh, regarding the state of Israel are sucking up the oxygen, eclipsing our study and pursuit of Torah, Jewish history, Jewish traditions. It just so happens that my son-in-law, who happens to be a rabbi, just sent me something that he published where he wrote that he would like to imagine a world in which Jews spend as much energy on their religion as they do on their politics. Quote, we are more at home debating the Iran deal and the grades of uranium that can be weaponized than we are in opening up a prayer book. We stand flat-footed when asked to consider what it means to stand in a covenantal relationship with God, end quote. The question is being asked whether it is time once again to focus our energy and resources on the religious and cultural life of America to give American needs a greater priority. The reform rabbis over 100 years ago argued that Jews in America had a mission to be a light unto the nations. Horrible events intervened to turn many from that priority to what was seen as a more defensive posture to establishing a Jewish haven for the oppressed. Today, we worry about rising anti-Semitism in this country and around the world. Ironically, the Jewish state that was supposed to temper down notions that Jews were aliens, goes without a home, uh, and uh, temper down anti-Semitism. Today, ironically, Israel and its policies has actually helped fuel the crescendo of yet more anti-Semitism, this time from the left. The mission of the Zionists have been accomplished. The state of Israel exists, but maybe now it is time to consider once again the stirring words of the reform rabbis of Rod of Sholem, who called for an emphasis on the spiritual life of American Jews and on a greater commission, commitment to the mission they so vehemently presented to the world. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Thank you, Barbara. Barbara, this yes. is Martha Berg. I, I just Hi, wanted to Martha. I wanted to clarify what I wrote about Rabbi Levy's death. He died in the spring of 1917, as you said, but the flu epidemic did not hit Pittsburgh until the fall of 1918. But a people... year and a half later, he well, didn't die of influenza. He died of pneumonia. But it was connected to the, I think there's some debate about that, Martha, because no, I've I don't read think, both of them. But okay, a, I'll, I'll It was a year and a half later um, that the first cases of influenza were seen in, in Pittsburgh. Okay, I stand corrected, thank you. Uh, Barry, Jane? I remember my mother telling me that when Israel was declared a state, uh, that Sunday, temple was, the sanctuary was full to overflowing, and Dr. Freehoff addressed the congregation and never mentioned the state of Israel. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. Why okay. was the... Uh, why was the sanctuary overflowing? You think People was... went because they wanted to hear what he was going to say about Israel, and he, he never didn't. mentioned it. <laughs> it was right after wow. it was declared a state. Interesting. Yeah. I saw that Rabbi Jacob was here. I, I don't know if he wants to make a comment. Uh Look, I, I'm throwing this out to you guys. You know, let's, let's, I mean, this is a fascinating subject. Um, and, and whatever input you have, I think is uh, interesting and worthwhile. So some of you have direct experiences. Did any of you ever have a conversation with Rabbi Freehawk about this? No, we never did, but I can remember my mother, I can hear my mother saying it and telling the story. So whether right. she ever had a conversation with him about it, I don't know. Right, right. Any other comments? Um, oh, hi, I'm Lucy Lauf. My mother hi, was Cy Lauf and Barbara your books gave her a lot of pleasure in the last years of her life. She read every one, uh, a diehard Gosh. Pittsburgher. Um, my mother did have a conversation um, sometime after she graduated college. 
about this with, I think it was Rabbi Freehoff, and I'm apologizing to all if my memory is failing in terms of what she told me. And it was really, I think, the only time she was disappointed in the temple because she was involved for her entire life when she was in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. uh, with the congregation. She was very influenced. She was in college during World War II. Uh, I think there by the grace of God go I. And she was very committed that there should be a safe place, right, for Jews. That was her, her thinking. And she did have a conversation and didn't get very far with Rabbi Freehoff. It was kind of, again, as you said, this kind of neutral thing. Didn't commit, but wasn't really willing to do much. And that's how she ended up getting involved in Federation, right? So that's where she did a lot of her volunteer work for most of her life. Um, and of course, Federation of was split for many years because yeah. uh, you had those Eastern European Jews who wanted to give more money to Israel and had a separate campaign. And then you had the campaign run by the German Jews, the more established Jews to give to uh, locally. So there's a whole history that I didn't right. go into about uh, fundraising and the different uh, avenues of fundraising and, and the conflict between the Eastern European Jews and the German Jews and where they wanted to give their money. <laughs> and so, yeah. uh, you know, this split is, is really can be played out in, in many ways in the community. But what you're saying about Rabbi Freehoff, I think is, uh, is fascinating. Anybody else have any memories or anything at all that they'd like to share? When I when I was in Sunday school at Rota Sholem in the 70s, so, well, yeah, around the time of the Yom Kippur War, I remember there being a Sunday when they decided that everyone was going to do activities in support of Israel. And I, of course, knew the family history that I revealed a few minutes ago, but I was, I was drawing my posters, but there were some kids who were not, who were not allowed to participate in that. Their parents didn't want them being even though by then the the synagogue was clearly supporting the state of Israel, there were still families who apparently weren't. That was that was when I think I first started becoming really aware. Well, there were there were definitely families in. I don't think uh, the membership and Martha, you might know this better. I don't know if there were many Pittsburghers who were members of this American Council of Judaism but they were definitely sympathy sympathizers with it. Whether they actually signed on the dotted line, uh, I don't think so. But this organization clearly had its um, supporters within the congregation. And that's why, uh, you know, realistically, Rabbi Jacob wanted to uh, kind of, you know, keep temper down this issue because it was so divisive. I guess it's kind of like rabbis today with the politics, you know, with uh, Trump and, you know, Republicans and Democrats, rabbis are reluctant to uh, state their positions because um, there are congregants who, you know, feel strongly one way or another. Any other comment? I love what you're saying. It's very interesting. Okay. All right, I guess now we'll have to tune in the news and see what's happening with the various elections around the country and um, see what's going on. And um, I just wanted to say um, thank you, Dr. Burston, for coming and doing this and speaking about this topic with everyone. We really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for joining. And um, we look forward to more of these sessions. So have a great night. And thank you again. Okay. Thank you.